Hey everybody and welcome to chapter 7. We're talking about thinking and we are talking about intelligence in this chapter. We're not going to be talking about language though. I know that that is a component of this chapter, but it's just not something that I feel like the, the textbook kind of scratches the surface of language. And language is such a big area in cognitive psychology especially that it felt like a disservice to really just do a little bit of it and and not really you know just skim the surface of it so i'm not going to talk about it here uh, i mentioned cognitive psychology because i think of this as kind of the cognitive psychology chapter um, and i you may remember uh from the beginning of the of the semester i am a cognitive psychologist that is my training so my training is all about studying thought processes and how they interact with one another and that's what this chapter is all about we'll talk a little about creativity and we'll also talk about intelligence um, these can be really difficult things to study and measure though that is a theme um, maybe I was gonna say of this chapter but really it's kind of a theme of our semester right when we talk about consciousness we talked about how difficult it was to measure thinking and intelligence we're gonna see that come up again as well uh, all right so the video that I have planned for you for today uh, is a, an old documentary from BBC uh, the British Broadcasting Co Channel uh, called Battle of the Brain I think it was I think it came out in 2007 so it's it's quite old uh, but it's it's a genius idea uh, or genius in, in more ways than one the idea behind the documentary is only an hour long with commercials and uh, the idea is that they have seven different contestants that are all geniuses in their own right so you have like a music savant uh, you have a, um, a, a, a a rocket scientist you have a theoretical physicist you have a screenwriter you have a um, who else um, I'm trying to remember off the top of my head who's who else is on there um, you have somebody who who specializes in taking intelligence tests um, and you basically have these seven come together and compete in an array of problem-solving tasks uh, and and so you can find one of those here at, at the 13 minute mark um, it's just kind of interesting, um, you know. Definitely, this isn't required viewing. Uh, but if we had, you know, if I saw you in person, this is the video, one of the videos that I would show for this chapter. I gave you two links right here because this video, um, they won't like. If you put it up on YouTube, it disappears within, an, you know, within the hour. Like they, for whatever reason, they're very protective of the copyright here. So that's why I'm giving you this Daily Emotion and Vimeo link uh, for that, if you're interested in watching. So last chapter we talked about behavior, and you may remember we talked about John Watson and behaviorism and B.F. Skinner. And the, what those three things had in common is that they were not really interested in the behaviors that we can't directly see or measure. So you may remember that that was very much influenced by Pavlov, right? Because with Pavlov you can directly measure the saliva that is generated. Um, and so people were very, very interested in, well, you know, psychology is this new science. If we want it to really be a science, then what we need to do is to treat it like a science and, you know, treat it like chemistry, treat it like physics, um, and only study the things you can directly see and measure. Um, around the 1950s, that started to shift a little bit because people started agreeing that some of the behaviors that we have that we can't directly measure are also really important. So like your thoughts and your emotions, those are things that you can't directly see or measure, but we would agree are important to understand human behavior. And so cognitive psychology is kind of a, a way of, of trying to systematically study um, thinking uh, and thought processes. Um, and, and, and learn more about how the brain works by looking at these kind of indirect ways of measuring these, uh, these things. And so um, cognitive psychology is a class that is offered here at Westfield. It counts if you're a psych major as one of the basic process courses. It is a class that I teach uh, and um, a class that I love to teach. Uh, but these, uh, all of these pieces down here are kind of chapters in uh, in that class where we have uh, two chapters on language, we have three chapters on memory, we have a chapter on decision making, a chapter on problem solving, a chapter on creativity. Um, so this chapter is kind of like looking at cognitive psychology and seeing some of the things that it is interested in. 
The first thing that we're going to do to get to that place to talk about cognitive psychology is to talk about one of the connections that we made in last chapter with behavior, uh, with learning. You may remember when we talked about learning, we talked about generalization, this idea that whenever we learn something, that we can apply that learning to a new circumstance, and that is an example of generalization. Uh, so an example of that would be like, if you learn that you love brownies, and, you, and whenever you smell brownies cooking, your mouth starts watering, much like Pavlov's dogs. If now, whenever I make um, uh, a chocolate cake, and you start salivating, because you can't wait to taste it, that would be an example of generalization because you're generalizing what you learned with brownies to this new thing, this new, very similar thing, a chocolate cake. Um, so when we talk about how we behave, it's probabilistic, right? So um, how do I know that you are going to do a behavior? How do I know that you're going to do something? I don't know for certainty that you will. Uh, I can give you my best guess. It's much like the weather, where the weatherman, uh, the weather person is going to tell you what you are likely to experience that day. But they're usually not going to give you 100% um, uh, odds. Sometimes they will, you know, like if, if it's already raining, then they'll tell you that it's a 100% chance of rain. Um, but they usually will give you 90% chance of rain or 10% chance of rain, you know. Um, and we, we're kind of the same way with, with humans, that with humans, we can predict them probabilistically. We can say, well, I know that you are likely to do X, Y, and Z. I know that you are, uh, that the class, and this is very sad, the class is unlikely to make it to the end of this video because I've seen the stats on the previous videos, and I know that um, uh, out of our class of 20 people, not all 20 people are going to make it to the end. Um, so when we're talking about how people behave. We're talking about probabilities. We're talking about how likely are they uh, to engage in something. And this leads us to um, to the question of representations. And I don't mean representation in terms of like diversity, but I mean representation in terms of stereotypes, in terms of um, uh, 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 what things you can expect based on probabilities. So, uh, and then the, this very, very vague, but a schema is an example of a representation of something that you can expect. You can think of a schema as like a blueprint for how an event is going to play out. Uh, so, for example, you walk into something that looks like a classroom and you're going to behave a, sp a specific way. So, and this, this leads back to this conversation about like, thinking about behavior as probabilistic. So let's say that I have a classroom and there are 15 people in it. It's the very beginning of the semester and you walk in and uh, it looks like a classroom. You, you see 15 people in there that are quiet, that they don't have anything out. They don't have their phones out. They're just looking straight ahead. What do you do, right? So how would you behave? Most people, when they see this, they're going to come in. They're going to look around a little bit. They're going to find a spot that's open. They're going to sit down at that desk or that table or whatever. And they're going to look around to see what other people are doing, right? But they're probably going to assume that this is a classroom, so they're not going to start a video call with somebody. They're not going to start a Zoom meeting with somebody else. They're not going to usually even call anybody on the phone. They're probably going to, you know, if they break out their phone at all, they're going to try to be discreet about it. Um, <clears throat> So that's an, they're not going to turn the table around. They're not going to turn the desk around. They're not going to start immediately watching a television show. Why? Because we generally know how to act when we are in a classroom. We know there are specific kind of uh, rules or blueprints for how we behave in that circumstance. And you could s imagine how that might be a little bit different than if you walked into a library. If you walked into a room not knowing what to expect and look like a library, you'll probably behave very similarly to how you did with the classroom, but you'll probably be a little bit quieter this time. You're probably not going to, or if you're expecting a class to be in there, you may look around, double check where you're at, because it doesn't look like your expectation for what a classroom is. Um, so our expectations um, are essentially what a schema is. Our expectations for what an event, what a setting, uh, uh, what kind of behaviors we should be doing there. So here is an example of this. If I were to ask you to tell me about this business, what would you say? So I want you to take a, just a, a 
20 seconds. Look at this image and tell me, or think to yourself, what kind of business is this? If you walked in, what would you expect? All right, so imagine that you walk in. What kind of food do they serve here? And you already knew that it was food, right? Um, even though you've never been to this location. So you know that there's food. How expensive do you think the food is? What kind of food do you think that they have? Um, do you think it's healthy? Do you think it's unhealthy? Um, how fast do you think it's going to take for you to get your food? Um, did I already ask how healthy <laughs> I, that food will be? Um, but basically, um, most people, when they see this, they think of this as fast food, right? And it is fast food. The reason why I'm showing you this specific place is because it's regional to the south, the southeast specifically of America. And so a lot of people up here in New England haven't seen a cookout. They haven't been to cookout. Um, and you may have even clocked, uh, you know, that it says burgers, barbecues, hot dogs, and shakes. But even if it didn't have that right there, I bet that if you saw this, you would have guessed they served hamburgers, right? Or if you didn't see that. Because it looks like a it looks like a place that serves hamburgers. It also looks like a fast food place, right? So you could probably expect that when you walk in that you're not going to be seated by a host. You're not going to have to have a reservation. And you, you're going to expect that you're probably going to have to go up to the front counter and place your order. And that it's not going to be, that for an entire meal, it's probably not going to be more than 20 bucks it'll probably be it looks like it's probably going to be less than that right uh, and that it'll probably be less than i don't know five minutes to get your food um you're basing all of this because you've seen other instances of places like this so this would be your schema for fast food because you expect when you walk into this place you're going to behave a specific way because you are expecting this to be a fast food restaurant because it looks like other fast food restaurants. It looks like a McDonald's. It looks like a Burger King. It looks like a Wendy's. And so that changes how you behave and what you expect. So schemas, and so, and if you if we want to think about this in, in kind of a behaviorist uh, point of view, we could say that our learning for how to behave in those other fast food locations has generalized to this new novel stimulus, this new location. So generally, schemas happen without us really being aware of them. We don't have to be aware of the schema. We just react to it. Um, I'm trying to think of a, an, a, another example off the top of my head. Restaurants are always, uh, for me, the easiest to think about. But like, let's say that if you were to go to... Um, uh, that your friend is a lacrosse player uh, here at Westfield and they invite you to a game and you've never been to a lacrosse game. You've never even seen lacrosse and what it looks like. Um, so you go up um, and you're going to have some expectation of what, of, you know, what lacrosse is. That there's scores, there's teams, that you're going to root for the home team, that it's outdoors, that it's okay to cheer and to clap. Right, and, and so you you have those expectations because they match your schema for an outdoor sporting event, and you may not even be aware that that's what you're doing. That you're thinking about all of this. That you're dre you're not going to wear a suit to this event, right? You're going to wear something comfortable, um, uh, maybe even something Westfield related, like I am right now. Um, and we, we generalize, we create those schemas without really being aware of them. And this is generally very helpful. And the reason why it's very helpful is because it is very efficient. What this means is that now I don't have to go into every single new restaurant and learn from scratch how to behave. I generally know how to behave in a fast food restaurant because I've been to other ones and I can generalize. And that is very efficient. I don't have to remember every single past instance of how I behaved um, in a Burger King. When I go to a new Burger King, I, I know how to behave. Um, just like if I walked into a restaurant and um, everybody was wearing fancy clothes and sitting down and all the tables had tablecloths on them, I probably know I should wait to be seated or I should look for the host. Um, uh, you've probably done that before, at least I have, where I walked into a restaurant and I'm like, oh, this is like a sit-down place. I need to look for 
the host so that they can show me where to sit. It's not like I'm going to walk immediately up to the kitchen and be like, yo, give me some sushi or whatever. Um, so because we don't have to really think about them, this can also lead to some, some stereotypes. Uh, and this is usually, again, without awareness, that we're unconsciously forming these stereotypes. And already right now, you're thinking stereotypes. Generally, people think of stereotypes as something race-based or gender-based, these kind of stereotypes about people. But I mean stereotypes in the more broad sense, a stereotype about a sport, a stereotype about a restaurant, a stereotype about school, a stereotype about cars. Um, but they absolutely can be rooted in people and in characteristics about people, like uh, stereotypes based from gender. So let's look at an example of that. So here is uh, an example. Um, Bob is an opera fan who enjoys touring art museums when on holiday. Growing up, he enjoyed playing chess with family members and friends. Which situation is more likely? So which of these two do you think is more likely? Do you think it's more likely that Bob plays a trumpet for a major symphony orchestra? Or do you think it's more likely that Bob is a farmer? Go ahead and place your bets. Which do you think is most likely? Okay, so the correct answer here is that Bob is a farmer. Part of the reason why this is the best answer and why for you it would be um, smart to choose that Bob is a farmer is because think about how likely uh, um, it is for you to run into anybody who is a farmer, especially up here at Westfield, right? It's kind of a rural area uh, of the state. And so it's pretty, pretty likely that we'd run into somebody who farms, who lives on a farm. When is the last time you ran into somebody who played trumpet for a major symphony orchestra, right? That's much less common. So even before we factor in, in any other evidence, we're probably going to say that, you know, that the likelihood that you're going to run into or that you're going to encounter any random person who plays trumpet for a major symphony is going to be like 2% likely versus some running into somebody who is a farmer is, I don't know, 20% likely. So it's already... 10 times more likely that we're going to run into a farmer. And I'm trying to be generous here. I would say it's probably more like 33%. Um, but what I'm saying here is that whenever you start reading this description, that Bob is an opera fan, he likes going to art museums, he likes to play chess, that you're starting to form a stereotype of what, about what that individual is. We're starting to assume that this is a highly intelligent person, that this is a person who has good taste in the arts and is cultured and whatever. Uh, and so when we see these two, which of these it fits closest to your stereotype? The one about this guy playing for a major symphony orchestra fits closer to your stereotype of someone that is an opera fan, somebody who likes going to art museums. It's not very close to somebody that is a farmer. When we think of stereotypes of farmers, we think of somebody who probably likes country music, right? We think about somebody who maybe likes the blues. Um, um, we're thinking about somebody who maybe just likes the oldies. Um, or, and, and that they probably don't like going to art museums. They probably like going to football games or, or tractor poles or whatever. Um, or, or, or races, I should say. Uh, because I, uh, <laughs> I should just start giving you facts about my dad because my dad was a farmer. Um, all right. So in this case, what we're saying here is that your schema for this individual is going to hem closer to this one than to this one, even if being a farmer is much, much more likely in the United States. Uh, here is another example. So now you already know that I'm trying to play mind games with you. So let's say that you are um, hiring for a factory job. Um, that you are in charge of doing this and you got 200 um, uh, resumes uh, and you know that 120 of those resumes belong to women uh, and uh, 80 of those resumes belong to men. This comes from a uh, example pulled from research, uh, which is probably why it's a very uh, uh, very binary example. I think if we do this in, real, in, in the real world, we'd probably have some folks identify as non-binary, etc. Um, but basically, we're looking at just men and women here. Keep that in mind because I'm going to be asking questions about that in a second. One of these applicants had previous work experience as a forklift operator. This applicant did not complete high school but earned a GED and is currently working at a UPS logistics center. So in terms of probabilities, on a scale of 0 to 100%, tell me what is more likely. 
Um, what is the likelihood that this person is left-handed? So go ahead and think to yourself, how likely is that? So when I ask this in the classroom, I get two separate answers. I hear some people say 50%, and I hear some people say, I don't know, 20% or so. Why? Well, because 50%, well, because if they're left-handed or right-handed, that feels like flip of a coin, right? So it's 50-50. But if you want to, if you want to, and which is okay, you know, to make, you know, to say that, but you can also think, well, what is the likelihood just for most people, if you chose randomly, that they are left-handed? And that's actually closer to about 10, 15, 20%. So what is the likelihood that this applicant comes from a wealthy family? Well, here you're looking at this and you're thinking, hmm, this doesn't sound like somebody who comes from a wealthy family, so I'm going to say kind of low. I'm going to say 20% here. What is the likelihood this applicant is female? And again, you're looking at that description, and you're like, hmm, I don't know. That doesn't really sound like uh, a description of, of a lady, so I'm going to say uh, 20% or something like that. All right, so what is the answer here? The answer here is that if we are going to make a decision about this last one, that really we shouldn't be thinking about this specific script right here. Instead, we should be looking at this detail right here. This is the only real detail that we have uh, about any kind of demographics or any kind of um, characteristics about uh, gender for our uh, sample, that we know there are more women than men. So if that's true, then actually the likelihood that this applicant is a woman is going to be much more likely um, woman than man, right? Because we know that the majority of our applicants are women and not men. However, when we read this description right here, this conforms to our stereotype. This looks like, this sounds like somebody who has a working class job and generally people, and, and has manual labor component attached to it. And we generally stereotype that as as a dude, right? We typically assume that, oh, that's probably some guy, right? Uh, even though here it's more likely that they are not a guy. Um, so this is an example of how a schema can lead us in the wrong direction, where we see all these stereotypes and we make decisions off of them erroneously. All right, this leads us into problem solving. So here is a classic example of, uh, of a problem to solve uh, called the wax candle problem. It is discussed in your book, so you may already know the answer to it, but the gist is pretty straightforward. Your job is to take this wax candle right here and affix it to the wall uh, so that um, you can light it and go to bed and not worry about burning the house down. Can you do that? with these implements you see before you. I'll give you a second to think about it. All right, so most people, whenever I ask them about this, what they will say is, okay, I wanna take the candle, I wanna put it next to the wall, I wanna strike a match, heat up the bottom of it so that this part gets all gooey and you can stick it to the wall and it'll stay there which I guess maybe that'll work for a little bit, but that flame is gonna be very, very close to the wall. I would not wanna to go to sleep with that. And also, knowing this will probably wind its way down and then, you know, fall down, you know, slip and burn the house down. Um, probably not a great solution. So this is an example of what's called uh, fixed function. Oh, sorry. Oh. Functional fixedness. Because the best way to answer this question, to, to solve this problem, is to empty out this box of tax so that you're left with just the box, use the tax to a, append it to this part of the uh, uh, of the wall. So you got your tax in there, so that's on the wall. And then you put the candle there, and then you light it. And that's the best way to do this. This was originally by a uh, an, an old um, uh, German uh, psychologist whose name is Carl, I think, Dunker. Uh, and uh, yeah, so, and I know that's kind of an unsatisfying solution here because most people get a little bit annoyed because they're like, wait a second, you can use that box as 
uh, as, as a platform. That's not fair. You didn't tell me that I could do that. But that's exactly the point, that whenever we look at this box, we have a schema for what this box does. This box is made for holding. That is what it does. That is its function. We don't think about it as being a platform. We don't think about it as something that can hold this candle uh, uh, through the night. So. Um, this is functional fixedness, and what that means is that it's the tendency to represent objects uh, as serving one specific purpose, one specific function, and not thinking about other examples of this. So like another example of this would be like if you have a screw that's loose, um, you might not think to take something like a paper clip or a guitar pick or a, uh, a penny and use that to tighten the screw. We don't think about that because we think about paper clips as having a specific purpose, which is they bind papers together. We think about guitar picks as for playing an instrument. We think about, um, what was the other thing? About pennies as being used for money. Uh, we ignore those novel kind of functions that they might have. Um, and we fixate on the old uses, not thinking about what they could use. So this is an example of, again, how schemas can uh, can deceive us and lead us in the wrong direction. There are some videos in case you want to learn more about functional fixedness uh, and problem solving. Uh, these videos, um, yeah, check them out if you're interested. Here is another example. Um, and again, and people don't like this example because, because the figure looks like you could easily grab this point and grab this point and hold them in your hands together. Um, but the, imagine that you couldn't. Imagine that this string was maybe a little bit further out this way so that it couldn't just reach really far and grab them. So the object of this task is to tie this end of the string with this end of the string. How do you do that uh, with just what you see here? Um, all right, so when I put this when I ask my students about this, um, first, they will be adamant to say, like, wait, no, actually, this person could just reach far down and grab it and then grab that. There's plenty of room. But again, uh, assume that this is a bad drawing and that this string should be further away. Um, so how would you go about doing that? I'll let you think about it for a second. I usually get people saying that they would, like, try to stand on the chair, maybe. Um, like standing, you know, placing the chair right here and then maybe standing here and then reaching to try to get up higher. I don't know. Uh, it doesn't work, but that's one strategy. Um, the ideal strategy that we have here is that we actually are going to take these pliers and we are going to tie one end of one of these strings to the end of this plier and then use it as a pendulum so we could rock the plier back and it's going to come back closer to us and whenever it does, then we can just grab it and then tie them together because they're closer to us. And it's because the, the pliers act as a pendulum. If you are making that um, uh, conclusion, then you are um, able to work past functional fixedness. You're seeing this, these pliers and you're not thinking about how they're normally used, which is you know to like to fasten things or to loosen things. Um, you're thinking about them in a new novel way uh, to solve that problem and you're thinking creative, uh, creatively. So what does it mean for, for problem solving and creativity to be linked like this? Uh, creativity is very connected with memory, which is not something that people think about all that much, but Creativity is all about thinking and drawing connections between things that we know about. So what do I mean? Basically, like if I am uh, a painter and I decide to um, try to, I'm trying to paint how this song makes me feel, for example. What I'm doing is I'm drawing connections between things that may not seem like they're directly related, right? Visual versus auditory in info. And so if I'm doing that, then I'm trying to behave creatively. And that is connected by memory because I can think about other solutions I have tried in the past and what has worked and what hasn't worked. And so even though I feel like when people talk about creativity, they usually think about it in terms of like a spontaneous way that creativity is thinking outside the box, which is true, there's a component of this that is very, very ordinary. There's a component of this that is very much rooted into 
trial and error and thinking about things that have worked in the past and things that won't work now. So if you are a painter, I know that several of you are very crafty, um, and so maybe, you, you, maybe you're a musician, maybe you're an artist of some other type, you have a pretty good idea of what's going to work and what's not going to work based on things that you've tried in the past. You know not to play a, gu a guitar this way, or you know not to, to use this, this specific synthesizer in this way, or you know not to mix these colors together because they don't match. Um, so um, here are some examples of prerequisites for creative people. Um, uh, taken from case studies of uh, working with create, uh, creative people. So people that are creative, they have knowledge in that domain. So people that are creative, um, let me think of, let's say creative writer. Um, somebody who is a creative writer is somebody who has knowledge about writing and generally has read a lot. Most, and that's, I know most people don't like to hear that whenever they say they like writing. They don't like to hear that they, that one of the best ways to become a better writer is to be, be a better reader, is to read a lot. Um, people don't like to hear that. But if you're an artist, if you're a visual artist, one of the better, one way to get better at, at, at art is to see examples of other art, to see what other people have done. Uh, to see what can be done in that in that domain. Another example is personality based. So looking at things like um, openness to new experiences or willingness to take risks, willingness to ignore criticism. These are things that um, uh, 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 we see with creative people. Um, we can also look at their motivation. So looking at people that are motivated by in the intrinsic action, the intrinsic reward, which just means that doing it is an, in and of itself is rewarding. So um, if you like riding a bike, then riding the bike is the motivation, right? You don't need to be paid to ride a bike. Just like if you're creative, um, you can be uh, motivated by just doing the act itself. Um, creative people uh, are sometimes at their least creative whenever they're being paid for it which is a really interesting thing. And maybe we'll talk about this later in the semester, but one of my favorite things about uh, to talk about in psychology is about how like, if you get somebody like, think about something that you do that's creative, whatever hobby it is. Um, and if somebody started paying you to do that, that seems like it would be a good thing. But what happens is that when people start paying you to do something that you previously would do for free, you then start to think about that thing as an obligation and as a job and you start disliking it um which is always like when when i hear people who are psych majors and they're thinking like about maybe i should switch over to being an art major one of the things that i like to mention is like that's fine but it's also okay to do art as a hobby because if you start doing art as a profession you might not like it uh anymore uh and there are also some situational factors that might go into uh creative people which is like being at the right place at the right time um you hear all the time about how like um uh maybe somebody um got noticed right um by another producer and that's how they got their you know their their start is because they were noticed or whatever that's an example of a situational factor um which is just kind of being lucky uh, at times all right uh here are some and so now to shift over a little bit talk a little bit about problem solving the book gives you these three different methods of problem solving trial and error algorithm and heuristic i would say that trial and error sounds exactly what like what you expect which is that you're going to try a couple of different problems or sorry you're going to try a couple of different behaviors until you find something that works fine whatever it's not very efficient it takes a while it can be very frustrating to do the algorithm method is where you have some idea about steps to go in. So this would be like, all right, I'm going to look at a checklist of things. And I'm going to follow this checklist. And then finally, the heuristic um, uh, method, which is that you identify um, essentially what the problem is and start thinking about how to solve it based on the conceptualization of the problem which usually means working backwards, which usually means like, um, for example, let me give you an example for, uh, for all of these things. So let's say if, um, if my Bluetooth headset is, is not working. So I got my Bluetooth, my favorite headset here. Um, if I don't have sound coming out of it, well, if I 
and I'm going to go through trial and error. Then what I'm going to do, I'm going to try turning it off, turning it back on. I'm going to uh, then um, check the battery, try to plug it in, see if that works. I'm going to try to play things on my computer to see if that works. I'm going to maybe uninstall or, 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 or you know, uncouple, um, what is that called? Unsync, desynchronize uh, that from my computer and try to re, you know, resync it up, uh, add the Bluetooth uh, device back. So that's fine, you know, that's, that's trial and error. Uh, if I want to do the algorithm way, then what I would do is I would probably search for Bluetooth headset disconnected and try to find, you know, a troubleshooter and then just go step by step. The heuristic would be like, because I have experience with this before, um, there's been times where I put on my headset and it's not getting music, and usually the first thing I think of is like, okay, well I know it's turned on, and I'm not getting any sound, and it said that it's connected, so that must mean that the sound is going to a different headset, or different, you know, other thing, because it is connected. So in that case, I'm breaking the task up to set into different steps where I'm thinking about like, all right, well, I already know that it's connected. So the problem must be something else. That's me using the heuristic method. And that's something that humans are very, very good at doing. So <laughs> this is why sometimes you see dogs dogs will look at you know the situation and they'll kind of like look at the fence look at the 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 bowl with the the bone in it and maybe pace back and forth bark maybe dig a little bit cry a little bit and a bit eventually they'll kind of pace around enough until they get to this fence and then realize like oh if i walk over here now i can come over here and get it even though this is the most direct shortest distance that i should walk away from this to get there that's a hard task for a non-human to learn, but once that non-human does it, uh, th once this dog does this once, then they're going to be more likely to do it again in the future because they have that knowledge base, they have that um, uh, that memory, they uh, they have that learned experience um, to do that. All right, now is a really great place to take a break uh, in in case um, you need to get a, a, a soda, a sodi pop, or something like that. Um, I'm going to take a sip of coffee. All right, let's get into intelligence. So intelligence is a very, very tricky subject to talk about, and I'll go ahead and mention that up at the top because um, I'm trying to think of how honest I should be here. All right, so, I'm gonna, so we're going to be talking about race, and we're going to be talking about race in some really uncomfortable ways. And so I'm just letting you know that up front. Um, my dog is crying outside the door. I guess he's he's like, this is gonna get uncomfortable. So, but just because it's uncomfortable doesn't mean we shouldn't talk about it. Intelligence testing is hard to talk about because it has been used time and time again for racist reasons. Um, and I don't mean this in like a, you know, like. If you squint your eyes, you can kind of see how it was used for racist reasons. Like, no, like the whole concept of intelligence testing was used uh, by by French phys uh, physicians who and statisticians who were looking to try to quantify um, uh, how good people are. So that way, basically, and this is all true. I teach history of psychology, so I know my stuff, and if you don't believe me, you can look it up. Basically, all right, so this quick story time, because I think it's important, it's important context for talking about intelligence testing, that basically um, these French guys were interested in uh, uh, trying to uh, promote a healthy population and a smart population in France, and what that meant is giving people intelligence tests and then trying to find the smartest folks and have the smartest folks breed with the other smartest folks uh, and then um, and then discourage the less smart people from procreating and, and having large families. So that way, the population of France would steadily, over time, get smarter and smarter and smarter because they are having the more intelligent folks breed. Um, that is the history of intelligence testing. So that is Alfred Binet. That is um, uh, Galton. Um, I was trying to think of what is it Charles Galton? I don't know. He was he was uh, uh, Darwin's uh, second cousin or whatever. But 
this is all to say that when we talk about intelligence testing, that there's a lot of controversy here because that's its origin. That's where it started. And that's to say nothing about how, like, in Europe and in, in America, how people would use intelligence testing as ways to deny people the right to vote. You probably heard about this. Like, your grandparents or your great-grandparents may have been alive for this, where basically they would say, like, you can't vote unless you do this intelligence test. And it would always be something that they would, you know, would be impossible for people to to uh, to to solve, just to make sure that people couldn't vote. Uh, so when we talk about intelligence, we have to ask ourselves, well, what does that mean? What does intelligence mean? And so you can think to yourself, like, what does it mean to have high intelligence? What does it mean to have low intelligence? And again, at this point, you might resort to schemas to think to yourself, like, okay, well, a high intelligence person that's probably somebody who has a lot of money. That's probably somebody who um, is charismatic. Uh, that's probably somebody who um, uh, uh, knows a lot of information. Probably somebody who has a college degree. And I say all these stereotypes because generally people will uh, people think that <laughs> that rich and successful people are highly intelligent. And so if you just start naming stereotypes about highly productive people, people think like, oh, that must be a smart guy. Um, but uh, uh, now think about low intelligence, right? So think about what behaviors you would expect with low intelligence. Um, what would what would it be? Uh, you know, what what things would you be good at if you had low intelligence? What things would you be bad at if you had low intelligence? What tasks would be hard? Um, so. At this point, hopefully when you're thinking about this, maybe you're thinking like, oh, this is kind of kind of a tough thing to think about. It's kind of hard. Like, So if we're talking about intelligence, if I asked you, you know, like, um, if the test was about trivia and about things you could read in, in the encyclopedia, like how fast is the speed of light, um, who wrote Sherlock Holmes, um, that, those kind of trivia questions, is that intelligence? If somebody scores really high on that, does it mean that they're intelligent? I don't know. Well, what about if it was really complex math problems? Would that be right? I don't know. Um, because I think probably by now, you, I think you would realize like, well, just because somebody can't do math doesn't mean they're not smart. Plenty of people are not good at math and are really smart. Just like there are lots of people who are really, really smart, but have no idea how fast the speed of light is because they, they don't really read all that much. They didn't go to college, right? So when we talk about intelligence, we have to be careful because we have to talk about, well, what kinds of questions are we using to measure intelligence? So how are we measuring intelligence? That can change how we define intelligence. So, and this, this is the take-home message here, how we define intelligence is dictated by how we measure it. So if I am measuring intelligence as how good someone is at math, then my definition of intelligence is probably going to be something about critical reasoning and math skills and probably not have something to do with like emotional sensitivity or music uh, or you know being creative or being artistic or being uh, very business savvy or whatever. So um, there's a lot of different ways we can define this which makes it really hard to study um, and is also a really good reason why we should be think very critically about whenever you're getting an intelligence test. You've probably had standardized tests before that you can be thinking to yourself like, well, what is this actually measuring? What is this actually telling us? So intelligence is measured through different kinds of testing and it's through different types of people. And usually, and when I say different types, I mean people from New England, people from the West Coast, people from the Southeast, people who are immigrants, people who have been in America for, uh, uh, who, who are native to America, people who uh, have third or fourth generation uh, immigrant families, people who are old, people who are young, people who are children, uh, people who are working class, people who are, um, bi are, are, are elites or whatever, um, that these tests will go out and try to standardize what average intelligence looks like in the world. And that's the premise behind IQ tests, by the way. IQ tests uh, are standardized because they're trying to get an indication of what is the average person's intelligence look like. Um, and the reason why this is useful is so that way we can like look at, for example, we can look at um, 
academic achievement uh, across generations and we can say like oh it looks like this generation is doing better than the last uh, or this this part of the country is doing better um, at, you know at school than this other part of the country etc so you can see how that that could be helpful that that could be important but more than that we can also use this to look at things like learning disabilities so that we can try to factor out accommodations to make sure that people in society have even playing fields. So for example, if I um, had auditory processing disorder, which is where you have an inability to retain auditory information, you're totally fine with visual information, but not so good with auditory stuff. Um, you might want to know that, right? So that way you get an indication of what does the average person's auditory comprehension look like. So that way you can compare yourself to that. And you can see if you have a deficit or, a, or an inability um, to, uh, to, to, to do that. It can be helpful um, in that way. And that test I was just telling you about is used a lot today uh, called the WACE or the WISC. The WACE stands for the Weschler... Adult Intelligence Scale. I'm going to show you a picture of that in a second. Um, but the WACE uh, is you, if you have ha ever had any kind of, um, like if you have dyslexia and you have any kind of like psychometric test done where it's like a several hours long test where they ask you a bunch of different questions, they make you do math. They make you do reading comprehension, they make you do vocabulary, they make you do pattern recognition, all kind of wild stuff. Um, that is an example of intelligence tests because they're giving you all these different kinds of tests to look at where you might rank compared to the quote unquote average individual. So uh, here's an example of an IQ test where we have, generally speaking, um, and we could talk about this for a long time because this is, uh, you know, this gets into statistics uh, as well. But an IQ test, this is the the broad population for the IQ. That most people are going to be right here at 100. That the average IQ is 100, and that as we move further down that it becomes rarer and rarer and rarer as we move further down. So the likelihood of having a 70 IQ is quite rare compared to an 85. There's just more people that have an 85 IQ compared to a 70 IQ. And there's also more people that have a 100 IQ than a 85 IQ. But there is just as many people that have a 115 IQ as an 85. And that's because we have natural variation in, in our population. This would also be true if we were talking about shoe sizes or if we were talking about height, that we would see that most people are right here around average. And then from there, it kind of slowly decreases until it flattens out. Um, it gets less and less likely to find people on these extremes. So if we were talking about height, for example, over here we might have three foot six, and over here we might have seven foot, right? It's very rare to find somebody who uh, is shorter than three foot six, just like it's very rare to find somebody who is uh, taller than seven foot even. An IQ is a ratio. An IQ is a ratio that basically says what is your age versus your chronological age. And I should say your brain age or your mental age here. So here this would be like if I was, if I had the mental quickness as a 20 year old, but I'm actually uh, uh, 30, I'm not, I'm older than that, then what I'm saying is that, oh, this doesn't look so good, right? Because this basically is, would be like a, I think it would be like a 67 or something like that. Um, basically, I'm operating like I'm 10, like I, it's as if I am, uh, uh, that there's 10 years I'm, mes I'm missing in my development. That would be an IQ of a 67 to give you an idea. Um, if we're thinking about uh, a 10 year old, so this 10 year old comes in, they are 10 years old, and they take this test and their scores are like a 20 year old, then that kid has a 200 IQ. And I should say that this is basically, this ratio multiplied by 100 gives you the IQ here. If that 10 year old takes it and they have their results look like an average 10 year old, 
then their IQ is 100. So that's where IQ comes from. But also, IQ is really just a predictor for quote-unquote success later in life. So this is measuring, what is it actually measuring? It's actually measuring later in life, how much money will you make? Will you stay out of jail? Will you have a large uh, supportive family and, and uh, friend system? Um, that is a very different definition of intelligence than what most of us are probably thinking, right? When I think intelligence, I think of like, does this person know a lot? Can they do math well? Uh, do they have good logic and reasoning skills? Um, but that's not actually what IQ seems to be measuring, right? IQ is actually measuring predictions for success, uh, where if somebody scores further down here, that means that they're going to have a harder time getting a well-paying job and staying out of prison and having a strong family system. Uh, and if they score over here, then what that means is that they're going to have a higher paying job. They're probably going to be, they're probably going to finish college. They're going to have a strong uh, social support system. Notice I didn't say anything about their ability to do pattern recognition or problem solving, right? So this is totally weird. We don't think of IQ as doing that. At least the public doesn't think of that. We think of IQ as being like, oh, bro, do you hear? She had 150 IQ. That must mean she's totally smart. What it really means is that, that by the time that person reaches adulthood, she'll probably have a great career uh, and, and strong support system. All right, uh, so when we talk about IQ, it is valid in the sense that it is really good at helping us predict life outcomes later in life. But I think that we can probably see that there are some problems here. Like this doesn't really account for things like self-control or motivation or your own discipline, your willpower. Um, so it's, you know, like everything, there's some good and bad with, with IQ. It's good for some things, but it doesn't really measure intelligence the way that most of us think that we are measuring it. Um, and there's also lots of potential criticisms about IQ as well, which is that IQ seems to be measuring things that Western cultures uh, value, and specifically white male-centered uh, 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 Western cultures. So things like math, things like good grammar, things like um, uh, uh, analogies and in, in symbolic interactions. Um, and this is a problem because uh, this is correlated with socioeconomic status. So what I mean here is that IQ should be something that is not influenced by your socioeconomic status. But imagine that if you were, if you belong to a wealthy family, do you think you're going to have the same academic opportunities as somebody that is in a working class family? Probably going to have an easier go of things. Your family can hire a tutor. Your family can hire the best school system, um, uh, private school system in the, in the state that can send you to boarding school or whatever, right? If you're a working class family, uh, Usually, um, working class families go to a lower income school system and school systems get their resources based on the tax bracket of their regions. So me, for example, I live in Waterbury, Connecticut, a, uh, a, a city that has a pretty low social economic status. It is a working class city. It's one of the things I love about Waterbury. But that also means that our public schools are very underfunded, that they do not have as much resources as New Haven's schools right down the road because New Haven, their, their, uh, their families have a higher tax bracket and so their school system gets more funding. That's just how America works. And so what I'm saying, and the reason why I just told you that nice little story is to tell you that basically what this means is that if you come from a rich family, you go to a rich school, that you're going to be more likely to do well on an IQ test. That doesn't mean anything about your natural born intelligence, right? So what is it that we're actually measuring when we're measuring IQ? We're kind of just measuring how likely you are to get ahead in life uh, whenever uh, you grow up. So, um, yeah, so if we gave an IQ test to somebody in mainland China, for example, their results could be totally different than if we had um, uh, somebody 
uh, uh, controlling for all other things uh, like social economic status taking in America because we're specifically targeting Western values like um, like, like like coming up with with, with symbolism and uh, uh, doing analogies and things like that all right uh, so like I said controversial area hard to talk about uh, there was a huge controversy in the late 90s early 2000s which unfortunately has kind of come back um, since I'm gonna say the late 2010s and it's kind of been in the culture since then um, that uh, uh, this book came out uh, the bell curve and this guy actually Charles Murray is still around uh, Richard Hernstein died um, um, not too long after this was published. But basically, this book came out, and it's a doorstopper. It's very, very large. It's like 700-something pages. And basically made this case about how intelligence um, is distributed throughout American culture in a way that leads to uh, unequal outcomes. And I know that that sounds like something that most people would agree with, but basically the argument was that folks that are working class, if you look at the demographics disproportionately people of color. Well, why is that? Was well, because, um, and, and they don't, they're very careful about how they try to say this. What they say is that working class folks are generally the lower intelligence folks. Elite class jobs are usually the high intelligence um, uh, folks. And so that's why we have rich people, uh, smart people getting richer and less smart people getting poorer because of these different career opportunities. And so essentially what they're saying is very, very pessimistic, right? Is that the reason why you're not making a lot of money is because you're stupid, is kind of what they're saying. Um, that sparked a, a, a huge reaction, huge backlash, where you had lots of scientists come together and kind of rebut this idea, probably most famously in this book right here, The Mismeasure of Man. Very, very interesting, fascinating um, uh, book about the history of intelligence testing and about how like we used to measure intelligence by measuring skull sizes and other kinds of nonsense uh and this is also like i said been around you know this is something that people every 10 years somebody else will, will publish a book like this that gets people talking uh and then you have to have a, a lot of people come around and try to disprove and and explain why this was wrong um anyways uh so Main point here, intelligence, hard to measure, oftentimes can be used to promote racist ideas or to punch down and to uh, blame the working class for their own conditions um, whenever we're ignoring other things like social policy. All right, this is an example of the WACE, and I wanted to show you this. This is the adult Weschler intelligence scale because what this does is it shows you IQ as being something that has multiple different varieties. So this is different from the normal IQ that you think of when you think of the regular IQ, which is Stanford Binet. This is the WACE, which is more commonly kind of practiced in, in, in professional settings. Um, much more credible uh, intelligence test because, as you can see here, it has lots of different tests in it. It has a math-based one. It has one that deals with letters. It has one that deals with purely verbal, uh, sorry, nonverbal things like pictures, like pattern recognition, reasoning skills, uh, symbol searching. And so having all of these different kinds of smaller tests uh, can be really helpful for helping us understand about ourselves. Well, maybe I have a deficit, not not that I am quote unquote stupid or below below um, below the average intelligence, but that I have some kind of problem with this piece, that I have a deficit in my perceptual organizational skills, and that seems to be dropping my IQ. But whenever I account for all these other skills, that it actually goes up a little bit. And you can see how helpful this would be in helping people understand more about themselves develop accommodations or study strategies for uh, how to how to get around these different kinds of deficits. If you don't like that idea, that's okay. Um, people have, have proposed different kinds of intelligence. One is general intelligence, 
which is also called Spearman's G. Spearman's G was developed by Charles Spearman, uh, and he believed that whenever we look at intelligence that basically there exists a form of intelligence that all these other smaller tests are kind of tapping into. So whenever you are measuring math, that you're measuring, measuring reading skills, that you're measuring reasoning, that they all seem to be kind of loaded onto one thing. And people have argued about what that one thing might be. Well, does that mean then that Spearman's G, this idea of one singular intelligence, that maybe what it is is actually adaptability? that Spearman's G, that this one kind of intelligence, that maybe what we're actually measuring is your ability to think on the fly, your ability to adapt to new circumstances. And here's just kind of an example of, of this where like, let's say here, you know, that this is math skills, and this is writing skills, and this is problem solving skills. and this is creative skills, that basically Spearman's whole point is that people who are really good at creative things, you know, might also be really good at writing things, might also be really good at math things, might also be really good at problem solving things, is because all of those skills share this notion of adaptability and your ability to think on the fly. People then kind of broke that down, Spearman's G, and kind of hypothesized that it could be two separate um, uh, intelligence subsystems, fluid intelligence and crystallized intelligence. You may have heard of those before. Fluid intelligence is your ability to think and process information on the fly. Uh, crystallized intelligence is the opposite. It's kind of like your acquired knowledge based on your own experiences. And so you can think of these as kind of like street smarts, quote unquote, and book smarts if you've heard those expressions before, where basically the idea is that like our fluid intelligence is how well you can adapt to new circumstances, how well you can roll with the punches, um, and book smarts is, you know, how much of a brainiac are you? How much of a history buff are you? How much do you know about engineering? You know, how much have you learned through college and things like that? Um, interesting kind of thing is that um, that these two things uh, that as we get older our fluid intelligence seems to decrease but our crystallized intelligence seems to increase. Um, people have then kind of gone through and broken uh, Spearman's G even more into different kinds of intelligence like musical intelligence, emotional intelligence, linguistic intelligence, spatial intelligence, mathematical intelligence, and so on and so forth. Um, I feel like a lot of people will talk about gardeners intelligence, gardeners multiple theories of intelligence, um, and I don't want to to harsh anybody's vibe too much, but uh, Garden, Gardner's multiple theories of, uh, sorry, Gardner's theory of multiple intelligences is not really practiced in, in mainstream psychology. It seems like it's kind of a, a, a an education, um, education sciences type thing. So if your background is in education, you may have heard of Gardner's multiple intelligences. We don't really mess with that that much anymore in psychology. Um, and if you want to know why, I'd be happy to kind of Tell, give you the evidence against it, um, but there are there are some people who out there will be like, yeah, there are 22 different kinds of intelligence, but you could just you could continually break it down into smaller and smaller things. Like, okay, well, you have a musical intelligence. Well, you have a performative music and a reading music intelligence. And in terms of reading music, you have you can be really good at reading classical music, but not so good at reading modern music. And so where does the line end? You know, you can continually break these things down. And it's like what we said at the beginning of the semester that, yeah, like we can break intelligence down into smaller and smaller slices because what we're doing is we're changing how we're measuring it. And that's what it comes down to. Um, so is intelligence inherited or is it something that we are born with? It seems like it is kind of inherited. It, there is a large genetic component. Um, and uh, it's tricky, though, like, 
And my mom loves to tell me this, like back because I was a I was a first generation student, so I was going to college. She didn't get a chance to go to college because she had me when she was seventeen. I shouldn't say this on the internet. She probably doesn't want people to know this. I'm sorry, Mama. If 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 you're watching, why aren't you watching something more interesting? <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, but she would always tell me like like um, if I did well in school she'd be like yep it's because you get your smarts from me it's because you know uh, but she was right like she is very intelligent and I think that I got some of um, uh, of my book smarts from her um, so there does seem to be a genetic component to this stuff but it is expressed through so situational outcomes as an example thinking about my mom my mom very smart but didn't always get a chance to show it because she didn't go to college until she was much older. Not that much older, in case you're watching mom, wink, wink. Um, but um, she, uh, so she wouldn't have a chance to act on those, you know, her intelligence because she wasn't in the right situations to do so. So these things can be very situationally based, uh, that your situation can dictate how much of your intelligence you can express and develop. Um, so you can think of intelligence as kind of like this raw, untapped potential. And depending on your circumstances, depending on your environment, you might have a lot of opportunities to kind of demonstrate that, to, to, to act on it, to develop it. Or you might be in a situation where you don't get a chance to do that. Um, here are some, some really fascinating results from some twin studies. So here what we have is, um, oh, there's so much to break down here. Let me, let me take a, a step back. What we're looking at here is um, genetically, uh, 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 sorry, monozygotic twins. So think of these as identical twins. Uh, dizygotic twins, so think of these as, so that's identical. Dizygotic, we got that as like fraternal twins. Siblings, so you know, they're born but at different times. And then parent offspring pairings. So if we are looking at raised together, so let's look at, all right, sorry, raised together over here, uh, looking at monozygotic and dizygotic. So they are raised together, and what we see here is a huge difference in the correlation between the IQs. That those that were monozygotic are much more likely to have the same IQ as their twin versus somebody who is dizygotic. So even if they were fraternal twins born together, yeah, they are going to have some amount of their intelligence shared, but not as much as if they were identical twins. If we see these monozygotic twins that were raised apart, so these um, uh, uh, identical twins that were raised in different environments, we can see that doesn't really drop all that much. How interesting, right? And this is the evidence that there is a lot of intelligence that can be inherited because this genetic piece seems pretty compelling in terms of evidence. Um, all right, and there's, but you can unpack this if you want to. There's a lot of really interesting stuff to, to think about here, um, where they took, um, you know, like looking at adopted siblings and, and stuff like that. And actually, I'm going to put something on Plato as an extra credit opportunity, um, a, a movie called Three Identical Strangers uh, that you can watch uh, for extra credit and write about it. Um, and if you don't see that on Plato, let me know, uh, because it has it's all about this idea right here. But well, what happens to people's behavior uh, if they are raised separate? Uh, all right. Thank you so much for watching. Uh, and if you have any questions, let me know. Hopefully I didn't offend anybody too much. But if I did, let me know. Um, and I'd be happy to continue a conver any kind of conversation, um, you know, in person, over Zoom, whatever works better for you. All right, y'all. Thank you so much for tuning in. I will talk to you later. Bye-bye.